All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, as you heard, this is Professor Kathy Bradley, and we're going to learn a little bit more about her today. So to start off with, let's start discussing your early years. Um, where were you born and raised? I was born in Oklahoma City um, and lived there till I was six, and then my family moved to Richmond, Virginia, which is where I grew up. My parents still live in the house that I grew up in, in Richmond. Okay, and what do your parents do for a living? Um, they're both retired now. My dad was a magazine editor for the Southern Baptist Foreign Mission Board, and so he wrote and edited and traveled a bunch. My mom was a, a public school educator. She was a teacher, then a guidance counselor, then a middle school principal, which is harder than just about any job on the planet, as far as I can tell. And do you have siblings? I have one brother who is two years younger than I am. Um, he is a hi very high-level engineer with IBM in New York. And did your parents influence your career trajectory? Um, yeah, my dad, I wrote a lot and like to write a lot, my, and I think that comes from my dad. Um, my mom, is, like I said, she was a public school educator, and that was my first career. I taught high school for six years before I went to law school. Uh, and so, although as growing up, I kept thinking, there is no way I'm ever going to end up doing this, and then that's exactly where I found myself after college. So they didn't tell me what to do. Um, there were no lawyers in the family. Um, they did, they gave me the freedom and the independence to make those decisions and certainly expected me to do well in school and expected me to go to college and then expected me to figure out what the next step was. And where did you go to college? I went to Wake Forest. Okay, and what did you major in while you were there? Latin and Spanish and then I took enough credits, uh, it was essentially a triple major to be able to teach because you had to be certified to teach high school through state certification process so I had to take education classes, did student teaching, all that kind of stuff. Okay, and um, when did you decide to go to law school? Um, I'd been teaching high school for about five years. I was in my, I guess, in my sixth year. And when I went to, when I started teaching high school, um, my, well, my professors at college had said, are you sure you want to do this? Like, don't you want to go on and get a PhD or something? And I said, no, I really, I want to do something. I don't want to just be in school the whole time. So I taught public high school. I taught uh, mostly in Winston-Salem. I taught for a year in Virginia before that. And I, I, what I told myself was that when I got to the point where it wasn't fun doing what I was doing anymore, where I thought I needed to do something different, then I'd figure out the next step. And so about four or five years in, I was enjoying teaching a lot, and I enjoyed my students a lot, but I also knew that if I kept doing that, I was just going to be stagnant, and I wasn't going to be doing enough. So I started looking around for what to do next, and law kept coming up as the thing to do. So that's the decision I made. And when you say it kept coming up, what, what does that mean? What drew you to that career path? I did a lot of like looking about sort of what are your aptitudes, you know, sort of the what color is your parachute kind of thing that was big back then. Um, and sort of what did I like to do? I like to write, I like to think. I did, you know, some like sample LSATs and said, oh, I could actually do this pretty well. And it just seemed like this was the thing to do. And I, it wasn't something that I had planned to do as a child. I didn't grow up thinking, yes, someday I'm going to be a lawyer. I actually thought at one point that I might go to med school, but then I decided that was going to take too long. And so um, it wasn't something that I'd had in my head all along, but it was something that at that point seemed to be the thing that fit. And so I decided I was going to leave teaching and go to law school and, you know, take it from there. So how did you decide where to go to law school? Um, I was in a relationship previously, before my current husband, that's Kurt Bradley, who's a professor here, and my um, then significant other w wanted to be in the D.C. area. And so we were going to lo locate there, and um, I looked at schools there. I could quali I got into University of Maryland. I got into other places too, but I got into University of Maryland. It was cheap. I could establish in-state residency, which made it really cheap. I visited the school. I liked it a lot and said, this is where I'm going to go. And what um, was your favorite law school class while you were there? Ooh, um, I probably have the most memories from my first year small section in criminal law because the, our, our small section professor was this guy who wanted to be really, really hard on us, but he really was like a softy at heart. I mean, he baked cakes for us and things like that. <laughs> Um, so I liked that a lot and it, and it stuck with me. Um, I liked family law. I did take that. That was my fun class in law school, the one that I took not because it was going to be on the bar or because I needed it, but just for fun. Um, and I really liked fed courts. 
um, which I uh, which was hard, but was also the most interesting class I think I took in law school. And what was your least favorite class in law school? Oh, um, my lowest grade was in torts first year, but I liked torts perfectly fine. Um, I wasn't. I, I took all the UCC classes. I'm not a real big, huge fan of the UCC, but pretty. I mean, I'd say pretty much. I liked. I just liked law school a lot, and I liked what I was doing, and I had good professors, and so there weren't any where I was going like, oh, I cannot believe I have to go to this class today. Impressive. Now you graduated number one in your class. Yeah. How did that feel? It felt good. Um, it was. But again, I hadn't thought that I was about going to law school. Sort of growing up, it was. And so when I went to law school, I was frankly pretty naive about what it was going to be like, and how I was going to do. And so I remember thinking, okay, I just want to make sure that I do well enough to do whatever it is that I need to do after I get out of here. And so when I, we actually did rank at Maryland, and they would post the ranks by student ID number. So it was anonymous, but if you knew your number, you would see. And I remember seeing at the end of my first year was when I hit first in the class. And I remember looking at that and going, oh, OK, like that, what does this mean? What am I supposed to do with this? So it was tricky to hold on to it for the whole rest of the time, because I was very busy doing other things. But it was a big accomplishment for me at the end of the three years to know that I'd managed to do all the other things that I did in law school, and had still managed to keep my grades where they were. So. And what were some of those other things? Uh, a lot of stuff. I did. I was on Law Review. I was research editor for Law Review. Um, I opted not to seek the EIC position. The, those of us that year did some jockeying around about sort of how we wanted the board to look and a little politics. That would never happen here, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, and so I actually wanted to be research editor, and that's the position I had. Um, I was on moot court. I was on moot court board. I competed up to the semifinals of our, interim, our intramural competition second year, and I also did an intramural competition my third year. I was uh, an orienta a student orientation leader uh, my second and third year. I was a teaching and research assistant for the dean of the law school, because he taught legal ethics. And so I did that my third year just for fun, because I was kind of bored and I needed something else to do. Um, and let's see, I was, on the, I was a student rep on the curriculum committee my third year. And I worked part time because I, Baltimore, the, the law school's in Baltimore, it's downtown. So you could work at firms or at court and do things and sort of get back and forth to the law school. So during my second year, I worked at the same firm that I had spent my first summer at and worked about 10 hours a week or so. So I kept busy. Clearly. <laughs> um, and then how did you end up deciding to clerk? Um, it's just, again, going into law school, I didn't know anything about clerking. I didn't know what it was going to be. But we, when we got to the point of where it was time to apply, which then was in the middle of our second year. It was, I applied in second year for my clerkships. Um, it was clearly the thing to do. And my grades were good enough that I could, have, I could apply to appellate clerkships. I'd be a contender for, for some. I applied to both a federal appellate and to federal district court and was sort of, you know, I was happy to go either way. And what one of my professors said was, well, you know, if you get a district court, you can always do an appellate later. And so I, I looked at who the judges were. I was, ge I was geographically constrained because I needed to stay within the region um, because of, for personal reasons. And so I was, um, but I, I looked at both sets of courts and then applied and then just sort of waited to see what happened. And what happened? I got, well, I got an offer from, I got, the first interview I had was with Judge Frederick Smalkin on the District of Maryland. And um, I interviewed with him. He offered me the job on the spot. He gave me several, he told me I could take a week to decide. So it wasn't one of the offers like now where you have to decide immediately. And he encouraged me to think about it. And it was a two-year clerkship offer. And I went back to the law school and I started asking people questions because he was um, highly, highly regarded at the law school. He had, taught, he had been a, a student at the University of Maryland and had had the highest GPA ever in its history uh, to that point. I don't know if he still holds that or not. And he had been a federal magistrate for a long time, was very, very smart, highly regarded, had just come onto the federal bench. So, and I was going to be one of his first clerks since he had actually become an Article III judge. 
Um, and my big concern was like, well, you know, should I hold out for an appellate? Should I do something? Should I wait? And what people at the law school wisely told me was that two years with him would be the best two years I could possibly ask for, that if I wanted to do an appellate after that, I could always apply for one, and that I was going to learn more with him in two years than I would doing anything else. So I told him yes. And then, then, then I took his class the next year because he taught, he was an adjunct at the law school, he took he taught commercial papers, so then I was in his class, which was a little bit of pressure, because I was really worried about what if I don't do well in this, and then I'm going to clerk for him, but it was okay. So you clearly did well. <laughs> did okay. What was it like for those two years then? What um, did you do? I was, well, it was a trial court. Um, he was he's a terrific teacher and a terrific mentor, so he expected us to be in court with him for the cases that were assigned to us. He encouraged us to be in court for other cases if there were interesting things going on. He would buzz from the courtroom and say, get in here and see this, you know, see this attorney or see this witness. Um, we did a lot of a lot of writing of, of uh, jury instructions, voir dire questions, all those kinds of things that have to happen. But a lot of me uh, memorandum opinions, uh, rulings on motions, those kinds of things. So I got a lot of writing experience, a lot of research experience, and the chance to see a lot of really good lawyers and a lot of really bad ones in court as well, which was very educational. So, and he was just, a, he was a great guy, very funny. Um, he, took, he, he took his job as mentoring us very, very seriously, engaged us in conversation, asked, took our views seriously, and, and was a terrific person to work for. So did that lead then to your second clerkship? Yeah, it certainly, it helped, although it's sort of an indirect kind of path. So I decided that, okay, my professors had said I could always apply for a second appellate, an appellate clerkship, and I figured, okay, I should do this. So I decided, but one of my professors had said, the same one, my con law professor had said, well, maybe at some point you should apply to the Supreme Court. And I thought, yeah, like, yeah, right, okay. Um, but I figured, well, what's the worst that can happen? So my first piece of advice is, you know, the worst that can happen is somebody will tell you no, okay? And the best thing that can happen is that somebody will say yes. So I applied to the Supreme Court. I applied to a number of federal appellate judges, including the DC Circuit and the Fourth Circuit and the Third Circuit. And then I just waited to see what was happening. And I was in the first year of my clerkship with Judge Smalkin. So this was, I was looking for like a year and a half out. And um, had a couple of interviews on the appellate level, didn't get jobs there. And then just figured, okay, well, I'll start looking and find a firm for what I'm going to do beyond. I had, you know, I had some firms that I was interested in in Baltimore. And then I got the call from Justice White's chambers asking if I would come do the interview. And so I, I did. Now, I'd had some help. I mean, again, it was, it's a huge long shot to get a clerkship like that. Um, I really didn't think I had much of a chance, but I figured what's the worst that can happen is that I will be told no. And I did have some help. Um, I, I'm sure I had a great reference letters, I'm sure, from my judge and from the dean of the law school who, for whom I'd been a research assistant. Um, one of the other professors at the law school who, who'd never taught me, but who knew me from other activities at the school, was a former Justice White clerk. And so when he knew I was applying, he said, do you want me to write a letter for you? And I said, yeah, that'd be really nice. So I'm sure that helped open the door. Um, and, and Justice White had a reputation for being willing to hire from schools that other people wouldn't, other justices wouldn't have looked at. He, liked, he was kind of contrary that way. Um, and he also was willing to hire from district court clerkships because he thought that that practical experience was useful. Um, and he had a habit by then of hiring one woman for each term. So I was his token woman, district court, law school, nobody's ever hired from. So. And what was that experience like? It was intense. It was it was a wonderful experience. It was a very hard year, uh, long. You know, it was, it's a very tough clerkship. Um, but I remember thinking every day when I would walk in, like it is just so cool to be able to walk into this place and work here. And it was it was a privilege to be there. It was a great experience. Um, that's where I met my husband. We were we clerked together for Justice White, uh, which is not what you normally expect with your clerkships, but it worked out pretty well. <laughs> Uh, we have very, very good friends from that year. Some of our closest friends are people that we clerked with that year. Um, so it's just an amazing experience. And it was great working for him because he was, um, he's very gruff and um, he had a, a, a sort of hard to deal with in some ways. But I'd taught high school, so you know, you could deal with anything at that point. Um, he did appreciate the fact that I think that there were times when my district court experience made a difference in terms of how he looked at cases. and. Um, so it was just an amazing experience. 
So then was he receptive to your opinions or what would happen if you disagreed with him on something? Can you tell us a little bit about that process behind the so, scenes? Sometimes he was receptive to our opinions. A lot of times he wasn't. Um, by, he'd been on the bench then for about 30 years. And by that time, uh, early in his, his time on the bench, and we, we know this from talking to people who clerked for him early on, he would actually have like long conversations with his clerks about cases and things. He wouldn't do that with us. He would, we would have a short uh, conference with him. We would give him a pre-argument memos about what to, to do, about what sort of our recommendation. And he would give us, uh, have a short meeting with us then. After the, the, the argument and after he conferred with the justices, he would just basically tell us, here's what's happening, here's what we're writing, you know. And we'd say, and he would say, okay, we voted to affirm. And we'd go, on what ground? And he'd say, it'll come out in the writing. Okay. And then we would have to scramble around to ask our fellow clerks in the other chambers, well, what did your boss say? And, and what, do you know what happened? Because he wouldn't share with us exactly what they had said at conference. And we would have to then figure out, so are they doing it on this basis or on that basis? Where's the split? You know, exactly who's really edging towards this direction or towards that direction. Um, but he would have, you know, he, there, so there were a lot of times when we didn't have a lot of dialogue with him. There are also cases where we did, and you know, there was one case in particular where it was, it was some, I don't even, I have no clue what the case was or exactly what the issue was, but there was, it related to something about how to interpret a rule of procedure and what a district judge would have meant by the way that the order was written. And he looked at me and he says, so, you know, what would your judge have meant if he'd written this? And I said, here's, here's how he heads to play out. And he said, oh, and I think it actually changed his vote on that mm. case. I don't think, I think it was probably the only time I ever changed his vote on anything. But, um, you know, it was clear that he was receptive to things then. There were also times when we would be in draft, we would have an opinion that was in draft, and we would sit down to talk with him then, and then he would be receptive to what we had to say in terms of, not just about sort of what do we think should be in there, because he was, he was the one who was going to make it, he was going to edit it and take out whatever he wanted and, and put in whatever he wanted. But he would listen to us if we said, we're hearing from, you know, Justice Scalia's chambers that they're worried about this issue. Or Justice O'Connor says she'll join if such and such happens. And those kinds of things would then get reflected in the drafts. And then what did you do after this experience? I went to work at Hogan and Hartson, which is now Hogan Lovells, um, in DC, um, doing litigation work. And how did you decide on that firm? Well, coming off the court, I had um, the ability to be a little bit picky, which is one of the nice things about clerking there. So I looked at a handful of DC firms. I knew Hogan by reputation because they had an office in Baltimore. So when I had done my clerkship with Judge Smalkin, I'd seen people who in that office, they had just set the office up. Um, I knew a number of the lawyers who were there who were doing uh, white collar work that Judge Smalkin highly, had high regard for. And so I was interested in looking there. And when I interviewed with them, it just, everything just clicked. And so I, I remember coming out of the interview going like, I wish they would just offer me the job now and I could just stop this whole job search thing and just pick one. Um, and it just felt like the right thing to do. One of my test questions for them and for all the firms was that I was, um, I was gonna be, I was an adjunct. Um, I taught legal, I taught uh, advanced legal writing as an adjunct while I was clerking for Judge Smalkin at the University of Maryland. And then Marilyn had asked if I would teach, continue to teach as an adjunct. I didn't do it during my clerkship with Justice White. But I said, well, yeah, I'll come back and teach one class you know, a year. And I was teaching Fed courts and for a couple of semesters. And I taught con law one semester in the night, in the night division. And so one of my test questions for the firms was like, well, I intend to teach one night a week. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm my alma mater, and, and they want me to teach con law or Fed courts. So these are not like you know, sort of light, lightweight classes or anything. And the response that I got from the firms told me a lot about the firm. So Hogan's response was, that's great. We have lots of people doing that. We think it's really important to have that kind of balance. Other firms did not necessarily have that reaction. And they came off my list pretty quickly. <laughs> so. When you started there, did you think that you would end up staying and making partner? No, I thought I would go for and work at the firm for a couple of years till I got a real job, and then I would like you know go do something useful like you know go. I wanted to be a prosecutor, um, was what I actually thought I would end up doing. I I had really loved what I'd seen again in my district court clerkship with the U.S. Attorney's Office was doing. I had a high regard for the the office in in Baltimore, um, and figured if I stay here, this is that's going to be the next deal. 
Um, but, you know, life happens. And um, Kurt and I got married. Um, there was a hiring freeze in the U.S. Attorney's offices. I liked what I was doing at Hogan much more than I thought I actually would. And so I stayed and ultimately became partner. And what type of work were you doing there? Um, litigation. It was all litigation. Um, I did, when I was in the D.C. office, I split my time between D.C. and Baltimore, and I did a lot of white-collar litigation, mostly like white-collar investigations, internal investigations, uh, did a, a, a Senate, an investigation for a Senate uh, uh, deal that was going on, um, uh, some antitrust, uh, a lot of Medicare fraud, things like that. I also did general, some general civil litigation, but I was able to be a little bit picky. So there were some things I declined because I was doing the white collar work. I did some appellate work. Um, I did some higher education work, um, and then some, just some general uh, civil litigation. Um, one of the things the firm did, they had an appellate practice group that was um, headed, not, he, he wasn't there when I first got there, but he came like the next year by John Roberts. Um, the Chief Justice. And uh, so I worked with him at Hogan. But they put all of the Supreme Court clerks nominally in the appellate practice group because it looked really good on their letterhead to have like all of these, you know, Supreme Court clerks associated. So I did some work with him and a, and a fair amount of work with that group, but that wasn't all I was doing. And um, when you ended up, we talked a little bit earlier about kind of your interesting trajectory. You ended up declining staying a partner. Can you tell us a little bit? about that process. Yeah, and it, it sort of winds around. So we were in D.C. for three and a half years. Kurt was working at another firm. We, our son was born. Kurt entered academia, so we moved to Colorado. Hogan accommodated that immensely. They, I, they had an office in Denver. I transferred to Denver. I went part-time at that point. And when I went part-time, I came off the partnership track. And I asked them, so if I come off track, what does that mean? They said, this will delay you for partnership. And I said, well, what does that mean? And they said, trust us, which is not normally what you want to do with law firms. <laughs> but, um, but the head of the litigation department was someone I did trust. So I said, OK, fine. So, and it worked. I, I worked part time, which meant, as um, Kurt refers to it as full time for less money, but uh, it, was, it was a manageable schedule. I worked basically four days a week, no nights, no weekends in the office, a lot of nights and weekends at home, um, and was able to manage life. And made partner one year behind my peers. So that was only delayed by a year. And then when we moved to Virginia for, um, to, to move to UVA, uh, where Kurt had gotten an offer, um, that first year we were there, I telecommuted. And the firm, again, was really accommodating. My clients were great. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was as good as it could be. But I hated being stuck at home, just in a, my office, you know, my study, just not being around people. And it was frankly difficult to make, to, to travel and to get back and forth to the DC office or to get back and forth to Denver. And so when we knew we were gonna stay at UVA, and I just decided I can't keep doing this. It's, it wasn't that I didn't like the work, because I loved it. Um, I loved my clients, I had really, really interesting cases, but it just didn't fit with what we needed to do as a family. So I told the firm that I needed to step out of the partnership. They allowed me to stay in as of counsel to keep the cases that I had going. I had appeals that were active at that point, and, um, and I took a position at UVA teaching legal writing. And so that was sort of the next step. So can you tell us how Duke is better than UVA? How many, how many, th how much time do I have? No. Um, <laughs> I have to be careful, I have to be good. Um, so the reasons we came to Duke, um, because you know, Duke and UVA, they, you know, they go back and forth in US news. Duke is better, it doesn't, the news rankings don't always reflect that. But um, we wanted to be in a place, my, the, sort of the, the three reasons were, I wanted to be in a city that was bigger, because Charlottesville's just small, and it felt too small, and too hard to get to like a decent airport and things like that. Um, I wanted to be in a law school where it was, the law school was smaller because UVA is not, it's not as big as Harvard, but it's got a significantly larger student body. And I wanted to have the chance to get to know students better, which I think is played out here. And we wanted to have the chance to do more interdisciplinary work. And a lot of schools talk a good game about that, and Duke delivers. And part of it has to do just with the physical layout of the university. So you can be across the street at Sanford or next door at the business school, or I, I co-teach a class this semester at the Divinity School. Uh, so there's those kinds of opportunities that didn't exist there. 
And the other thing was that, frankly, I was teaching legal writing, which is an immensely important class. It's the most important class you take in law school. But for me, it was the way I'd felt when I was teaching high school, that if I keep doing this the rest of my life, I'm not doing what I should be doing. And there's something else more that I should be doing. And I wasn't going to have that opportunity at EVA, um, or not without a lot of pushing and shoving to be able to do it. And when we started talking to Duke, um, the response here was different. And uh, Kate Bartlett, who was then the dean, basically gave me a, a long list of things that I could do if I wanted to when I came here and let me choose. So, Well, and let's talk a little bit about the many things that you do here. Um, you are currently the director of the Legal Ethics Program and the administrator for the Capstone Project. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your role in both of those? Um, the, well, the director of legal ethics, I've held that since we got here, because I've, I teach legal ethics, and um, Dean Bartlett asked me to be the director, and I said, okay, whatever that means. And so, at first, I wasn't quite sure what it does mean, but what it means, what I do, is to try and make sure that we've got an ethics curriculum that gives you practical skills, prepares you for practice, and gives you an array of things so that the ethics classes mean something, because I think they're fundamentally just incredibly important to everything you're going to do. Um, so we've developed some additional courses. We've got the readings and ethics offerings, things like that. And I just try to oversee to make sure that we've got enough offerings, that there's some variety, and that they're going to give every student a core grounding in the ethical rules, and not just the rules, but beyond the rules, so that when you go into practice, you're going to be an ethical lawyer, and that we're not going to be reading about you, you know, on the front page of the newspaper for having been suspended or disbarred or anything like that. Um, so, and that's been, it's been fun to help shape that and to sort of see, we're working on some new classes now to sort of see how that program should develop. And to think about exactly sort of, you know, what, is, what does it mean to teach ethics? Is it just the rules of professional responsibility? What other things should be there? How, we've, we've fitted in with uh, the clinical program and the externship programs and, and made it a, an important part of, and a prerequisite for doing those things. So that's part of what we've done there. Um, the capstone program is a third year program and it started it was approved by the faculty the spring before we arrived and again it was one of those things that I was asked to take on um, I also along with that was uh, heading the externship program which Dean Bart has taken over but it, they, they, they kind of went together at that point and the capstone programs an opportunity for third year students to create a project that the best way I can describe it because it's kind of amorphous is like a master's project so that it's interdisciplinary usually it's got a practical component to it usually maybe some scholarly work as well and you do a project over the course of a semester or, or better a year in your third year and then have something at the end that says okay this is what I've this is something that's special to me that I've done you present it to faculty um, and it, like you would a job talk or a, an oral presentation or a master's uh, presentation and we've had a number of students who've done some very very creative things over the year Great, and you also teach family law. I teach family law. And how, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into that? Um, and yes, generally maybe a little bit about your own experience adopting a child. Yeah, so how I got into it. So I said that when we were looking to come here, um, uh, Dean Bartlett knew that if she wanted to get my husband here, she had to make it good for me too. This is an important thing, okay? She's, and so, and I didn't actually expect, as I, as I told you earlier, I didn't actually expect to end up in the law school. What I was asking for was assistance making the transition to do something in the area. Um, but she gave me this list of things that were possible, including teaching ethics, which I was already doing at UVA. Um, and including, you know, things like doing the, some administration, uh, doing appellate advocacy, things like that. But one of the things on her list was family law, and which was kind of interesting because that's her field. I mean, she was one of the authors of the casebook that I now use. And so for me, it was like, if she trusts me to do this, I've never taught this before, but if she thinks that I'm able to take this on, then that says a lot about at least her confidence in me. I'd never taught it before. I had taken it in law school, and the class that I took then was structured a lot like the one that I teach now. There's a lot of, of constitutional component, a lot of policy, sort of big picture stuff. Um, I had also done a number of things that sort of fit with family law. So I was, um, a, in my spare time in Charlottesville, um, I was a court-appointed special advocate, a GAL um, volunteer for, for kids in Charlottesville for, for four or five years. Um, I had done a number of the, of the 
problems that I had used for my legal writing class were family law related. There was one on parental kidnapping, and there was one on marital rights of post-operative transsexuals, which was great for writing sample purposes and things like that. Um, and then we had adopted Liana. And so I had gone through the adoption process. And so I had, I felt like I had pieces of the knowledge and I could sort of bring it all together. So in terms of teaching family law, the, I, the reason I like it is because everybody's got a family and everybody deals with family law whether you like it or not at some point in your life. Even if you're just getting married, you're dealing with law at that point. Um, it's, it's deeply personal, but it's also it's hugely policy driven. So, I mean, the fact that the Department of Justice decided last week they're not going to defend the DOMA statute anymore is a big, big deal. And to watch how quickly the law is changing in these areas that influence every one of us is really fun. Um, and, you know, for me, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's sort of the ultimate policy issue about how does the law decide what it gets to decide about who we are and how we define who we are and how we define our relationships with each other. So I like to bring that to class. Plus it lets me to talk about all kinds of weird things in the news. Um, as I told you earlier, if there were a way that I could bring Charlie Sheen into my class discussion today, I would do it. I, I haven't figured out that connection yet. Um, so for me it was like, you know, it was an immense, I felt like there was an immense amount of trust placed in me to take on this class and it's been an immense amount of fun to do. It does allow me to draw on sort of the constitutional dimensions of things that I've taught and dealt with before. You know, it's cutting edge and the law is just changing very quickly. And it's got a lot of practical basis to it, which draws on my practical experience. Even though I never practice family law, it's, this is, you know, I can still say this is how you need to think about this as a lawyer. So that's why I like teaching it. Well, I'm curious, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I think other people here might be interested in your response to um, family law kind of being a soft law or a kind of women's area of law and what your response to that would be, especially coming from um, what might also be characterized as kind of a firm, um, more real law background. Um, I mean, I know, I, I understand why people say that about family law, but the fact is, like I said, it's, you know, it's core constitutional law, it's policy, it's tax, it's business law, it's everything all together. And, you know, it's, it's interdisciplinary in a way that a lot of other legal doctrine, you know, doctrinal classes are not. Where they're very, you know, it's like you're going to learn about business associations, okay? But here, you need to know something about that in order to be able to do the family law piece of it as well. So I think the reason that it's, I mean, it's certainly gotten the idea of being a soft law because it's family law and because women have traditionally practiced it partly because it's been most conducive to dealing with the balance with family and work. Um, you know, the, there was, uh, Hogan had a woman when I got to the firm who did trust and estates and family law things. And, and what she, she was fabulous. She also did a tremendous amount of pro bono work and other things and was extraordinarily hard working. But, but that's kind of the niche they had put her into when she had come up through the ranks. Um, so I think part of it's just a historical matter and I think it's unfortunate. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it deserves that sort of soft label. Well, going back to adopting your daughter, you also have a role now with the Center for Adoption Policy. Yep. Can you talk about that a little bit? We adopted um, Liana from China in 2002 when she was a baby. She's now nine. And um, so, and so that, adopting a child, I mean, having a child changes your life. Adopting a child sort of all of a sudden puts you into another sort of next category. The, the adoption matters in a way that you might not have thought about it before. And so I was, became, as lots of adoptive parents do, involved in lots of um, internet groups and things like that, dealing with adoption, just uh, sort of sharing stories um, and adoption issues. When we moved here, um, there was a woman that I was put in touch with who named Diane Kunz, who's here in town, who is an adoptive parent herself. She has four sons, biological sons, and four adopted daughters. And, and she has help, okay? Um, <laughs> And, and she's, she's brilliant. She's got a PhD. She's taught history at, at Yale and at Columbia. And, but in sort of her next life, what her, her career has been to develop the Center for Adoption Policy, which is an NGO that fosters ethical adoption policy. And she does a tremendous amount of lobbying work and, and strategic work with the State Department and other places. So she's a good friend, and she and I do some things together. So I'm not on their board or anything, but um, she sends me interesting things all the time. We advise back and forth. She has a conference that she does every year. There'll be actually this week in New York, and I'm going up to be a moderator on one of the panels there. 
Um, so uh, it's it's been a it's interesting to sort of again take this personal thing. You know, I, we adopted a child. I didn't think it was going to influence what I did professionally, mm -hmm. other than it was going to mean that I was going to have to like leave early some days, right? So, but it's changed the direction of what I teach and, and sort of what I do. Um, what advice would you give to your own children um, about their careers? Would you advise them to go to law school? coming from two parents who are both law school professors? Well, our, we have a son who's a high school sophomore, so we're dealing with this issue now. And um, I suspect he might end up at law school at some point. Uh, I say that sort of with a sigh. Um, <laughs> but what I've told him is, I mean, what I've said to both of them is, you, you know, our daughter who's nine says, what do you think I'll be good at, Mom? And I said, I don't know yet, but you're going to figure it out, OK? What I've said to both of them is, you figure it out. And that it may not be the same thing. It's not like you pick, and you're, OK, OK, now I'm going to do this the rest of my life. I mean, you look at my career. I've taught pretty much all my life in one way or the other. But that's going from high school to being an adjunct to now being here. I've been in practice. I've done all other kinds of things. And I never knew, I could not have said, you know, 10 years ago that this is where I would end up now. Okay, I wouldn't have had that kind of vision. So what I've said to them is you've got to figure out sort of what you like, pick something you like that you're good at, and sort of pay attention to what the next step is. And realize that you're not making a decision for a lifetime. You're making a decision sort of for the foreseeable future. Uh, what I've also said to our son is, if you want to go to law school at some point, that's fine, dear. But I want you to do something else between undergrad and law school. And I want you to have some other kinds of breadth of experience and see the world in a different way before you decide to go there. And for those of us who can't do that, because we're already <laughs> in law school. Too late. No. <laughs> what advice would you give law students today if they were entering or leaving <laughs> the university? Um, if I, well, if I were giving students coming into law school now, I'd say think carefully about whether you really want to go to law school. I think law school is a fabulous experience. I've loved it, I think, and I think Duke is a tremendous place. But I think it's something that it is a it is a commitment, and it's you. I don't have to tell you this. You know, it's hard, okay? And it's it's hard, and it's it's a, an intense three years, and it's not something to undertake lightly. So what I'd say to any student is think about what you whether this is where you really want to be. Um, in terms of going forward, what I'd say to, what I always say to students is trust your gut, okay? So if a firm doesn't feel like the right place, don't go there, okay? If there's, if there's something that is really calling you that you think you want to do. Find a way to do that, or at least sort of figure a way to build it into your life so that you can do it moving forward. Um, and you know, you've got to figure out your path, which isn't necessarily what's going to be the same path for someone else. And um, you know, there's no, particularly now in this economy and the way the markets changed in the last few years, there's no one right way to do things. And I think that's particularly true for women. I think men tend to end up with more of a linear path of their career. They start and sort of move through things, OK? But like mine, you know, it's kind of wandered and meandered around. And that's not at all unusual, I think, for a lot of women, just because life happens and you end up with other responsibilities and, and sort of be open to that. If you could do it all over again, mm. would you do anything differently? Oh. <laughs> no. I don't think so, but I th it's probably a good thing that I can't do it all. Because I think there are times like giving up the partnership was a really hard thing to do. Um, I didn't realize at the time how much it was going to affect me to have done that. You know, in hindsight, I think I'm exactly <coughs> where I'm supposed to be, doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And so if things hadn't happened the way they did, I wouldn't be here now. Um, but, you know, if I'd, if I'd realize, you know, maybe if I'd realized how much it was going to, to be a big deal for me to, to take that step, then I would have said, well, let me see, is, is there, would I have tried something else? Would I have done something? And I'm not sure that would have been the right decision. So, in, you know, looking now, I can say, looking back now, I don't think I would have changed anything. But that doesn't mean that there weren't difficult decisions to make along the way, or that the decisions were easy ones at every turn. And then finally, we have our traditional actors studio questions. Um, what is your favorite word? My favorite word um, is discernment. OK. okay. And what is? And I, yes. I, can I, get, can I explain yes, why? Please. OK, so I, I teach, I co-teach a class at the Divinity School, which is quite an interesting experience. And it's, it's a class 
uh, it's a pastoral counseling class teaching them like how to do family counseling, okay, and like marital counseling. So I come in and tell them about divorce law. Uh, which is the nice, you know, it's kind of a counterbalance. But in the divinity school, they're always talking about discerning things and discernment. And it's never like figuring things out or analyzing. It's about trying to sort of perceive things. And so I like that word, and I think it's a good way to approach life. Do you have a least favorite word? Well, yeah, my, it's sort of a class of words. My least favorite word, this is, a, this is a law review kind of picky thing from back when I was in law school. My least favorite word when I was in law school was impacted. When you would take, okay, like you know, something impacted something else. And it just would drive me nuts that people would take a perfectly nice word like impact and then try and make it into, like a, as a noun, and then make it into a verb. And so all of those sort of like techy, like making things into verbs that really should be perfectly nice nouns. Those kind of things just kind of bug me. <laughs> Writer, professor, at yes. your core. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Mm. If, if <laughs> I would be a travel writer. I love to travel, and I would, you know, I, I, this, you know, sort of in fantasy life, it would be, I would say like travel agent, but then you have to deal with customers, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> I just want to go places and like, you know, write about it. What is the next place you plan on traveling? Well, there's a good chance I'm about to book a trip to Turkey for, in May, um, but I am sort of on the verge of like actually making, you know, just doing it. And if I go, it'll be me by myself going for two weeks. So my husband and I, so, and my husband did a trip like this last year and they were like, so where's your wife? Are things okay at home? And, you know, but we found that we, we love to travel and we travel a lot together. But there are also things we like to do that are different. And so last year he went to Turkey by himself and I took our son to Ecuador for a week over spring break. This year he's taking our son to Eastern Europe and I might do this by myself. So we do some trade-offs like that. Good arrangement. It is a good arrangement. Um, if you could meet anyone in history, who would it be? Anyone in history? Ooh. Um, Living or, gonna be like living or dead, or did yes. it be like? Well, I've already seen Oprah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't actually met her. Um, Jimmy Carter, who I was gonna meet when he was, he was supposed to have been at the regulator a couple months ago, and then he got sick when he, you know. So, uh, and because I like, I mean, you know, he gets criticized a lot as having, in terms of how he was as president. He was the first president I ever could vote for because of the states to me, right? As I, I had just turned, um, I was 18 and the 18 year olds had gotten the vote. And, and I voted for him. But he wasn't necessarily sort of our best known president. But I like the way he's taken his life and he's done things with it since and become a statesman and become a voice for peace and those kinds of things. So I'm sorry that I didn't get the chance to meet him when he was here before. Um, what trait do you most like about yourself? Curiosity. I like to, I, I'm interested in things and I like to keep learning things. What is the quality you most admire in other people? Um, the ability to see individuals for what they're worth, to sort of focus on individual people and not sort of class groups. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have a few questions? I think we have time. Yes. Um, you, you said a, a number of times that how your teaching career has kind of spanned multiple different kind yeah. of venues. What is it about teaching that, um, that really appeals to you? Um, uh, this, I mean, this is family. I mean, I, I guess part of it is that my mom was a teacher. That's part of what I saw and knew, and, and I think that comes naturally in that regard. Um, I think I like, I mean, I like being in front of a classroom. I like working individually with students. The, things that I, the thing that I like best about it, um, it, it requires me to keep up to date on things and to keep learning, which gets to the curiosity piece. I like being able to work with students one-on-one, -on -one, both so outside of the classroom as well as inside and uh, just sort of bring a lot of things together and, and communicate information. Others? Anyone else? Yes. I, I, I'm not a student here. I work here, but I've been to all of these inside the professor studio. Um, and there, there's a common theme, and the common theme is something that you said earlier, sort of be prepared for your 
land on uh, life happens as you put it. Do you think that's a hard thing to get across to students who are, who are trying to set um, concrete goals and, and sort of head towards them that, that they may veer off and uh, that's okay? I think it is hard. I, I think because you, you expect, you know, because you're sort of taught like this is the path you're going to take or here's what law students do, do or here's what the next step should be. And if it doesn't, if that next step doesn't come that easily, then you think, oh, wait a minute, something I must be doing something wrong, or you know, everybody else is doing this. And you know, I think that I mean, I was been very fortunate. I had you know the start of my career. I did really, really well in law school. I had fabulous clerkships. But if you had asked me starting law school if I thought I was going to end up at the Supreme Court, I would have just laughed at you. Okay, if you'd asked me, you know. After my clerkships, if you thought I would end up teaching family law, I would have said, you know, I don't know where you're getting that from. So, you know, I do think that you just sort of have to, this gets back to the discernment, you have to be open to sort of focusing on what works for you and, and realize that, you know, in most instances, whatever decision you're making, you're not making for a lifetime. You're making it for now, and if, if, it's, if you're thoughtful about the decision, then the right thing will follow. Okay? Like I said, I can't, be, I can't tell you that there, at every moment I thought, yes, this is abs I can say this is the right thing to do, or this is what I need to do. I can't say, yes, this is the next best step for my career, but it's worked out that way. I'm going to add one more question, okay. even though I've been asking all of them. Just because from our conversation earlier, we talked a little bit about women having to make slightly different choices than some men. And I think, particularly since there's a lot of women in the audience, um, this might be an apt time to talk about kind of how those choices get made and how women face some different issues. Um, one of the things I said to you earlier, I mean, I, and I said earlier, like, guys, they, this isn't always true because their paths can take different career paths as well. But, it tends to look more linear. It's like you sort of start here and you sort of move along, move along, move along. And women do tend, I think, to sort of meander around. And I think the hardest thing is that um, I think it is possible to have a career and a spouse and a family and do all those things. I don't necessarily think it's possible to do all of them equally at the same time. Okay? There's always going to be some trade-offs. And the trade-offs are worth it. But you have to be conscious that you're making those trade-offs. And I think one of the things that is still frustrating for me, I would, I would like to be able to, I, I told uh, Anne this earlier, I'd love to be able to sit here and tell you there's no sexism in the law anymore, there are no gender issues, I'd be lying to you. Okay? The fact is that I think women still have to deal with these issues in different ways. And that one of the things that's hard is figuring out what choices to make and how to get it across that the choice you're making is not because you don't care about your career. It's because you care about other things too. And the hardest thing is to, you know, to say, okay, I'm going to make this decision for my family or because this is what I need to do, this is the right thing to do. And then have people say, oh, well, she must not really be serious or she wouldn't have made that choice. And what they don't get is what you're serious about. And I think that's the thing that, you know, men ought to have to face this too. But the reality is that I think it's still something that women deal more with. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much to Thank everyone you. for coming.